Am I right in saying that you met Mutt Lang at Roundhouse Studios during the recording of ACDC's Highway to Hell? Um, yeah, basically I was introduced to Mutt uh, by a mutual friend, a guy called Adam Seif. Mutt had mentioned to Adam that he was getting ready to mix the ACDC album and he wanted to get this kind of real solid English rock sound to it. And Adam said, oh, I'll tell you, the guy that you should get is Tony because he worked at Island's Basing Street Studios on Free, Mop the Hoople and stuff like that. So he's very much aware of what that sound is all about. So then I got invited to go down to the session at Roundhouse and just meet everybody and basically got hired. Do you recall anything about your first impression of Mutt? Oddly enough, I'd actually met him sometime earlier than that, probably a couple of years earlier than that, because this same mutual friend, Adam, he had a small studio down on the south coast of England, and I used to do quite a lot of engineering there, and Mutt was kind of the um, house producer for Polygram Records at the time, and he brought an artist down there called Red Hot, I think it was, something he was producing, and he didn't want anybody to engineer the session for him, he wanted to do the whole thing himself so I just kind of got him going on the session and then left him to it for the day with the assistant so we'd sort of crossed paths once before and all I really knew about him was that he worked a long hours <laughs> because he certainly did on that those particular sessions. So it wasn't the first time of meeting him. He's a really cool guy. He's a very nice person. So it wasn't difficult to get on with. Um, and the rest of the guys, very, very friendly. Bond was the most friendly. I mean, I'd only been in the room about five minutes and Bond was, well, do you want a cup of tea? And so he went and made me a cup of tea and I just kind of sat around chatting to everybody. I know you were faced with some challenges on mixing that record and one being, uh, I think you had told them that next time due to how Mutt recorded with the separation of things that he should add some ambience later. Could you explain how you would do that? Well, it was a technique that I'd used on a number of occasions, actually. It was just simply, I just wanted to have some sound from each of the microphones or each of the instruments bleeding onto the other instruments. So it's something that I can normally call it ambient glue. It's what makes up the spaces between the instruments and what helps stick it together. So it's pretty simple really um you just choose certain microphones and you feed them through into a pretty hefty set of speakers in the recording room and then put a couple of microphones up and then feed that back into the mix it's not that dissimilar from adding reverb or um chambers but it's under a slightly more controlled situation and of course it's a lot drier than it would be with a chamber where you're actually encouraging the chamber or the echo plate to be much more reverberative and resonant what you're doing here is you're just really adding the sound of the room to the other sounds of the instruments. On Back in Black, I put up ambience microphones, and on Back in Black, we recorded more of the instrumentation um, at the same time than was the case on Highway to Hell. A lot of the things on Highway to Hell were, were overdubbed single instruments, whereas on Back in Black, all the songs were recorded with two guitars, bass and drums live in the studio at the same time. Was the band involved in the mix of that album or was it just you and Mutt? Um, they were in town when we were mixing it um, and they basically they would just kind of drop by at some point during the day. It was most of the time it was just Mutt and me mixing and they would just come down and, and check out what we'd been doing. How much of the sessions were you there for on Highway to Hell? I was the, only the mixing. I mean, we did, there was still some, uh, there were a couple of vocals still to finish off. Um, I think Beating Around the Bush was one of them. So we had to do those. I think there was a little bit of solo guitar that needed to be uh, dropped in on one of the songs. But the rest of the time, it was just the mixing. I think we mixed it in probably eight, ten days or something like that. So I was really only around for that part of the whole thing with I Would Help. It was very much my kind of music. I still, to this day, think that a, a touch too much is probably one of the most underrated singles of all time. I thought that was going to be massive, but um, sadly it wasn't. But yeah, it was just, it was a lot of fun. It was great. It fitted, you know, it's its kind of, it sounds a little bit arrogant, but I, having worked all those years at, um, at 
Basing Street Studios, I was kind of used to all the bands that came in or all the artists that came in were really good. So I was used to being exposed to great bands, great songs, great musicians and so on. And, and ACDC kind of fitted into that pattern of things. How would you describe your working relationship with Mutt? Is he basically there the whole time with you kind of guiding or are you kind of feeding off of each other? Um, I think it's one of the things I always say is I don't work for people, I work with them. And, and Mutt was a classic example of somebody that you worked with. So, you know, we fell very easily into um, what my job was, what, what I was responsible for doing. And I was the professionalism that I'd learned at Island Studios at Basin Street. I was able to call upon that because that's what we did. The most important thing to us was to do the job as well as it could be done and everything else took second place to that. So I just carried on doing that kind of thing. So for instance, you know, when we went in to mix at Electric Lady Studios, I, I went in the day before to set up the monitors so that when Muck came in, we didn't have to fiddle around with those sort of things. And obviously he he called the shots, the buck stopped at him, but there was plenty of room for um, for my input into, into things. And um, he just trusted me to kind of get on and make sure we captured all the things Things that we needed. I mean, we, I think we sometimes slightly disagreed. You know, Mutt would particularly want to have the perfect take with the perfect arrangement and so on and the perfect feel as well. And sometimes you got a take that felt really good but was a little sloppy. And there were times when I'd say, well, maybe if I can edit that bit into there, we can tidy it up a little bit. Would that work for you? And sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. So it was a good working relationship. Was there anything you learned from Mutt that influenced the rest of your career? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's probably one of the best vocal producers that I've ever come across, and I've taken so many of the lessons that I learned from him in that respect, and and also the um, just general respect for musicians. There was a circumstance we were working on something, and there was a bass player who um, just, we were, there was a simple bass part, and he was just having so much trouble with it, and we spent quite a considerable amount of time trying to get this bass part right, and I knew Mark being a bass player that he could play in about five minutes flat, you know, and I said, why don't you just play it? And he said, well, I could play it, yes, but it would destroy him, and he needs to play a lot more bass on this album. And I suddenly realized, you know, there's more to it than just kind of getting the job done. There's people involved, and they deserve the, the help and respect that they, uh, they should have. You know, creative people can be fairly... Uh, um, Sensitive. Awesome. Yeah, sensitive, and sometimes they find it more difficult to deal with those sort of situations. So I think you have to be careful. I think, you know, um, producers and engineers need to put their arrogance on one side. <laughs> and so Mutt would always make sure, no matter what, that that person played the part. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he's obviously, he's he's gone through working with other artists where he has replaced Stuff, but he's done it in conjunction with the artist. I mean, Def right. Leppard could probably be a very good example of that. He basically led that through one note at a time. But um, but that was that was a that was always agreed and was understood by everybody that was involved. Regarding his vocal style, what was it that influenced you? Well, I think that the thing that I learned was everybody views singers as being slightly difficult and a little bit neurotic and so on. You know, there's plenty of jokes about it. And I think what he taught me was that it's not an unreasonable thing for a singer to be like that because if you're a guitar player, you can change your guitar strings. And if you're a bass player, you can change your bass strings. If you're a drummer, you can change your drum kit. But if you're a singer, you've got the voice that you've got. And what you don't want is a situation where the singer starts to get insecure, feeling insecure about that, because that's just going to introduce more neurosis. So I think you've got to spend a bit of time making sure the singer feels comfortable and um, making sure they've, they've got the right lighting, they're in the right part of the room, that they've got the, the head 
create firm balance is really something that feels good for them and encourage them and also looking at the way the lyrics are written sometimes there will be a word in a lyric that it might work absolutely fantastically from the lyrical point of view but maybe on a note where it's much more difficult to sing that particular shape of uh, word so there's so many nuances within the whole process of producing singers I mean there's an example I, I very often use is that I was working with a, a singer who looked particularly great when they were singing. You know, there was you know, so there's some singers just, just look, wow, they switch on, the whole personality shines through. And I kept saying, oh, come out of this, that was a great take, it was a really good take. And they come into the control room, we'd listen back and think, oh, that, I'm sure that was better when you were doing it. And I suddenly <laughs> realized that I wasn't actually listening with my ears, I was listening with my eyes. And so I put the singer around the corner so I couldn't see them. And from that point on, um, I, I judged the excitement of the vocal that they were producing on the basis of what I was listening to, because after it's a record, not a video. And I found that was a lesson that I taught myself that was important. But it, it led from learning from Mutt that you've got to work with singers to find out what it is that's going to switch them on, what it is that's going to make it work. And as far as Mutt on backing vocals is concerned, he's got the most incredible voice. The only other person who's got a voice as incredible as his is his first wife actually stevie when they first came to england apparently they used to do backing vocal sessions together and their voices almost sounded exactly the same the thing about mutt as a backing vocal singer is if he was in a, a bunch of backing vocals you would have his fader almost completely out with everybody else's at the top because it no you keep taking keep taking him down and you could still hear his voice cutting through all of the rest of the voices. Quite extraordinary. When he stacks his harmonies, he's basically taking the chord and maybe doing the first and the third and the fifth. It's pretty straightforward, really. It's just, it's, you know, big big chunks of stuff. I mean, obviously not on ACDC. Right. That was, Those are pretty uh, raw uh, records. Yeah, that's edging more towards the football crowd, but um, right. <laughs> on Foreigner and most definitely on Def Leppard, um, that's for sure. Brian's voice, which I was, I guess, a little shocked just because of the power behind it and almost seems like you might have to go to a dynamic mic, but it looked like you used an 87 on his voice. Yep. Yeah, an 87 and an 76 that was it and you printed the 1176 yes just a, just a little bit uh it, it made it easier for him to move in and out on the microphone and, and maintain dynamics anything else stand out about his vocals for that um no i mean you know we he worked extraordinarily hard with those vocals and um it was a huge ask to to do that and you know I mean that was where the perfection came in from Mutt's point of view he really wanted every single one of those lines to absolutely count and the typical way that we would record would be to do three or four tracks of the lead vocal and each one of those tracks we'd probably drop in a few words uh, here and there so what we ended up with was three or four tracks that in their own right would be pretty okay and then we would go through line by line uh listening comparing each one of those tracks and choosing which one we were going to use sometimes it would be just a word at a time on one track and sometimes it would just be even one syllable and then we would go through and compile that um onto one track um something more i mean you know something of a, a, a labor of love that and it's so much easier to do with Pro Tools, but if you're doing it on multi-track, it's uh, multi-track analog. It's a long, drawn-out process. When you're recording vocalists, was it typically just you, Mutt, and the singer? Did everybody leave the room? Everybody's different. Brian, we didn't really have many people in the room, but that was because the band weren't interested in listening to Brian singing one line over and over again. So that was a bit of each, really. Um, but of course, Brian needed a lot of kind of support and help because it was massive task that he was being asked to undertake. Lou from Foreigner, uh, I mean, I'm still convinced there are at least 30% of the vocals on the album were the ones, the guide vocals that he did whilst we were recording the backing tracks. Um, and he's just the most amazing singer. So you, you've got a, you've got different things um, with Boomtown Rats, um, different yet again, big 
because that sort of punky music really didn't lend itself to the uh, incredibly polished vocals. Was there any difference with getting the right vocal take on Back in Black and Foreigner 4? Were you and Mutt basing it more on a gut feeling or were you guys looking for perfection? Um, with Back in Black, it was trying to get the best combination of perfection and feel. With Foreigner, that was even more the case. Um, it was very much the sound of Foreigner is is it doesn't lend itself to um, to looseness much at all. Whereas the sound of ACDC has much more of a bluesy kind of vibe to it, so it can sustain a bit more looseness. But with Foreigner, the punchiness and the directness, and it needs to be just that little bit more polished. Knowing his style to begin with, it just seems like so much goes into the details, including even the song order. But um, he's very much known for deconstructing songs and reconstructing. Is he doing a lot of that with Back in Black? And also, it almost seems Seems like four or four. You see more of his um, Def Leppard approach, maybe. Um, back in black, basically, there were little changes to arrangements that went on uh, when we were recording them, but they were just during the tracking process. There was no deconstructing and reconstructing that went on with those songs. Even with Rock and Roll Ain't Noise Pollution, which was written in the studio whilst we were in the end of the sessions, basically. But with Foreigner, Mutt spent a lot more time in pre-production rehearsals. In fact, I was ready to go over to New York a couple of times and it got postponed because they weren't ready. So there was a lot more, and then there was a lot more of the stuff that got changed after we got into the studio. But you, you, I think you've got to take into consideration there that there was a lot more influence from Mick. Mick had much more of a producer head on him. Right. So part of the trick there was for Mutt to include Mick without Mick taking over, but not to exclude him in a way that he felt he didn't have the control he wanted over the music. So, you know, I mean, there were two two very, very different records. It's funny because that first song on Foreigner almost sounds a little ACDC-ish a bit, but um, no, they definitely sound completely different. The drums almost come off as a drum machine on Foreigner 4. And I had heard that Mutt liked to do things to a drum machine or a click track first, and then the drums would come in at the end. Was he doing that on either of those records or was Back in Black kind of the standard approach where you get the drum tracks first? Back in Black, we cut two guitars, bass and drums at the same time. No clicks. Which he's known to basically be just an incredible timekeeper anyways, Phil Rudd. Absolutely. I mean, when you capture a band like ACDC, you have to capture them the way they are. So but what about... Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Before and before, it was a, a different situation. That was inevitably going to be mostly drum tracks first. But um, yeah, I mean, there were a variety of different timekeeping methods that we used on uh, Four and a Four. And there was a lot of editing involved in it as well. So it's a lot of deconstructing those songs on Forner and rearranging? Um, yeah, sometimes actually just moving bits of tape around. <laughs> Some of the old school guys I'll talk to about pre-production, they would complain that sometimes it captured more of the vibe and they'd go in to record the song and sometimes that was lost. Whereas, say, nowadays, the pre-production basically turns into the actual song, right? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I've always guarded against, I, I've actually said it like this, is I've uh, said to people, when we're in the pre-production stage, don't record the album now, please. I've tried that. There were a couple of artists that I tried it with where I said, let's go into a studio to do pre-production and we'll record everything just in case it comes out really good. And my experience with that has been that it doesn't because you might capture a couple of little aspects of it, but um, generally speaking, it stops you from moving forward creatively. So I'm a little bit wary of doing that. I, I think that you have to leave as much as you possibly can open to develop. So you, you've got those basic components but you you need to encourage those to develop at the same time so i think that's yeah i, I know what that is it, that um the the other problem you see that does arise is that you get demo itis then you get rough mix itis you know where there'll be a certain point when somebody in the band or the artist says oh yeah well i really like the way this happened in the demo uh, and you have to kind of lead them through yeah okay that was great but none of the rest of it was 
you know, we've improved everything. Let's just work out how we can bring this particular component into what we've done. You know, let's not just change everything and spoil it for a as we say, a haven for the tar. Let's, let's try and keep it moving forwards. And it's the same thing with rough mixitis. You know, if, if you let the artists run around too much with rough mixes and they play them to all their friends, then you'll get one of those friends who, when you f do the final mix, will say, oh, I really like the rough mix much better. And it's not because it was any better. It's just because they've become familiar with it.